then kick it off. Um, I uh, avoid video like the plague when I can. Um, so I think people should have access to these uh, meeting notes and you're welcome to add in um, other items on the agenda bashing. Um, I'll just start out as I usually do with the um, total numbers and these, I'm just reading these from um, here, but uh, it's kind of insane right now. So we're up to um, 63 certified vendors. Uh, new ones keep coming out of the woodwork, including some Kiwis in the last week and 74 certified products. And you can see that we're up to uh, 15 1.11 certifications. So um, I, I, mean, I think the fact that all these certifications are taking place via the GitHub repo means that it's pretty transparent um, how it's taking place and issues that come up and other sorts of things. But of course, anyone's welcome to speak up if you have questions or concerns about it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the, the process right now. Um, so if there's not any other pieces, maybe we can talk about Shanghai and then um, I guess we'd probably wait another month on Seattle. But I think, um, was it Doug or Brad who signed up for the um, intro and deep dive sessions and we could just briefly plot those out? Yeah, actually, um, there was, uh, I think a person from Huawei actually did, this, did the signing up. But yeah, the Huawei, IBM, Google are all working together on the, um, on the agenda for the deep dive and intro. Great. And I think I sent you a note with the link in it. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Hold on a sec. Um, I'll just paste these in here for folks reference. Why so uh, what would you like to settle on right now? Um, okay, there's a link to the uh, plan agenda. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that we need to settle on it. If people have questions or concerns about the doc, uh, we do have a meeting every two weeks. So I guess we have one not this week, I think next week, to go over um, concerns or questions we have and then start hashing through uh, some slide decks. Uh, sounds great. So I, I'm planning to show up and um, maybe do a two minute intro, but I, I'm, I'm totally happy to defer to the working group on anything else. In, unless you, if you want me to do more, please, please let me know ahead of time. Yeah, no, um, I'll add that to the to the list, and I think Aaron might be doing the intro right now, so I'll leave it up to Aaron to decide how he wants to to balance that time with you. Yeah, I'll work through that with you, Dan. Um, my like, I'm happy giving a, a broad overview, but I haven't been historically involved with this group since its inception, so I'm sure you can help me add a whole bunch of context. Okay, and of course, we already have a ton of Chinese um, conformance members, so there's already a lot of interest there, and hopefully you, uh, a number of them will show up. In fact, we'll reach out to our members to encourage them to do that. Um, so should we move on to uh, July's action items? And um, HH, do you want to chat for a second about where things stand? Kippy Hacker, you're on, I believe, but are you muted? Yes, I'm muted. Sorry about that. Um, sure. We've made a lot of um, uh, progress in adding to the different components to be able to enable auditing. Um, so if I'm speaking to something in the agenda, I mean, uh, there we go. Uh, we did the graying out of the links, and um, we still haven't done it through for the test yet. Um, sorry, I, I wasn't expecting these to get thrown in that quick. Uh, the audit logs. Oh, we, we, you know, we, we can circle back to you. I think you would prefer. That'd be best. Uh, why don't we do Tim? because I'm particularly interested, Tim, on this question of pulling the 
test your run from upstream. So I'm testing the audit log to my computer to uh, uh, Tim, can hey, hip, Hippie, can you go ahead and mute? So Tim, you have some two high level questions about backlog and state and documentation updates, which I feel like I'm gonna answer as I roll through my agenda items. So I'm interested in what specific questions you have not covered below. Where is the backlog? Like where's the canonical backlog for the, one of the things that should be addressed by this group, like we've, we've unleashed folks to work on stuff, but it's not been transparent as of yet. Like who is doing what, where, and what the actual execution backlog is. I know we've talked about it a couple of times in previous meetings, but uh, if we want to go into detail into where that is, that yeah. would be helpful. I think the TLDR is I'm ramping up to getting us a backlog and I want help from this group in appropriately populating that backlog. Um, so I'm hoping the update I provide will provide sufficient transparency on what we've been doing and why for now. But question why you, like why you in yes, particular versus- I have, versus have that, I have that question too. Yes, I have that question too. Um, and then what was your concern on documentation update? Um, just a, just a, a update with the state of getting documentation in place for the conformance tests so we can point folks at issues. Because I know that we had done a lot of effort to get a lot of documentation in place with regards to, uh, you know, specking out and having a well-defined uh, text and that was supposed to be auto-published to the doc site eventually or to some location, but I don't know what the state of that is either. So that would also be per pertain to the backlog. Can anybody other than Srinivas speak to that here? Okay, the brief, the brief part that I'm aware of is that there were a number of PRs outstanding to put that text in that I helped Srinivas get merged. And as of right now, um, I have no bandwidth to further assist in automating the creation of those docs. And as we'll discuss below, the way those docs were generated walked through a slightly different list of tests than what Sana Boy uh, has been running for this program. So there's, there is work there to be done. Um, the docs we're talking about are the ones that end up landing in Kate's conformance, in the Kate's conformance repo under the uh, what is it under the docs directory uh, right now? There's one for cube conformance 1.9 and cube conformance 1.11 This was this group's desire to have like human readable descriptions of what the tests are and why these are the things that define conformance um, My personal opinion is it is not all the way there in being a consumable or be useful um, I had initially tried an effort where I thought, well, if this is what the end result's supposed to look like for describing like what all the different test cases are, we could maybe work backwards from something like this, where we write out all the test cases in human readable form and then figure out, and then like, you know, implement those. But um, personally, this, this needs to be pushed forward. I have no bandwidth to do it. I would be willing to help whoever does have bandwidth to do it. So if there's nothing there, I think I want to just roll on to the rest of my agenda. Um, no, I, I, likewise, I, I, this is Mitra. Uh, I, I have the bandwidth to be helping out with any kind of reviews in this area. I do not have the bandwidth to be doing the PRs themselves. So, so I apologize, like I'm majorly distracted there and I, I've missed the conversation, but I did ping Srini to make sure he joined the call and he's on now. Maybe Aaron or somebody else could summarize what you guys are just talking about. Because obviously Srini is very much involved in that. Yeah, yeah. So, so my concern is the state of automating the publishing of documents based on the comments in the conformance tests. Uh, that's not there right now. So right now it's like Srini had to go manually run a command and then take the output of that command and then open up a pull request against the Kate's conformance repo. How are we going to automate this process? And then, like, personally, I further have concerns that, like, the, it, the, the comments are kind of brittle, but I, I don't have time to take issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Srini, I, th I think you've, you've, you've thought about how to automate that process, I believe, right? 
Yeah, vaguely. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Aaron and I also talked about it a, a little bit. Uh, we need to uh, certify something on those grants. I mean, I'm open for any suggestions at this point. So. Uh, it needs to be automated. It cannot be parsed. Uh, Right. Okay. So, so obviously, I don't think we necessarily have the solution right now on this call, and I don't think this is the right form to necessarily hash through a solution. However, I think Srini will take ownership of making it happen because we need to automate the process somehow, some way. Yeah, I'd be happy to help with that. Um, we have to just brainstorm. Probably um, um, one-off meeting, like you know, um, breakout session where we can brainstorm on this. Uh, I can set one up. Um, okay. I'm looking for own, not help, to be clear. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Srini? Yeah. Not Strong to be a jerk about it, but like, I really need you folks to push stuff forward. I can't yes. be the only one. No, no, no. No, Aaron, you're, you're completely yeah, right. You're right. Srini, you will own this, right? Yeah, Srini yeah. will own it. So, real quick question. This goes back to Eminence Trivia, which was my first question. Is like, where are we going to track this? Where's the backlog? Do we not have a repo that we can track issues in? We could use the conformance repo to track some of the stuff into triage and use it that way, or we can use KK uh, and just provide that enough labeling so that way we can at least, if you just put it inside KK, it'll get lost forever. There's too much. <laughs> but if you put in the CNCF conformance repo, you can actually track it and it's small enough where you can manage it. One of the problems is the tools are spread out between KK and so, that's one thing we need to work on. So, uh, not all the tools are in. I guess I would suggest that perhaps this group's interests and backlog should be tracked in this group's repo. Yeah, and I agree. If there are like technical issues or bugs that relate to the sausage making over in KK, that's fine. But ultimately, we should be tying back to uh, like we could open a project board on this repo, right? Do something like that. I hate project boards for what it's worth, but we can totally do it. Whatever works for your, you folks. No, I, I think let's just start off creating issues or whatever inside of our repo and track it in there. And if we didn't import something more complicated than an issue, we'll figure that out as we need it. So Srini, can you open up an issue to, to track the progress or the, the requirement of automating the generation of our, of our, of our documents? Right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so if you, you folks don't mind, I'll, I'll move on to my agenda items in, the, in here. I put in a lot of info. I'm not sure we're going to have time to really drill deep on all of these. This is kind of a, in, an intent to catch you all up on what I've been doing for the past month and get us discussing a couple things and then make sure I drive that discussion to the appropriately actionable places where I need decisions. Um, so, Aaron, I, I'm super interested in all this, but could I just ask for Tim that we had one other piece of the um, uh, how the sauna buoy would, would pull the instructions from upstream. Should we yeah, add I'm that as a separate item after yours? So I'm about to get into that. Are you, okay, great. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So let's, let's um, the first item is refining the definition of conformance. So the definition of conformance is something that the Kubernetes project owns. Specifically within that, it's SIG architecture. As I've been drilling into this, I've noticed a couple inconsistencies. The first thing was that there were tests with the conformance tag that lived inside a directory called E2E node. Uh, E2E node is just node conformance tests, which is a completely separate and orthogonal concept to conformance as we care about it here. So. I updated our gatekeeper that guards the list of tests that the project considers as conformance to stop looking at that directory. And I've had folks from Globant work on moving those tests over to a directory where they will get run as part of conformance tests. Next. So, wait a second, pause there for a second. Pause. You've had folks from Globant. Like, where is that work being tracked? So I have opened up issues in the GitHub in uh, in KK, and I've been applying area conformance labels to that. And I've been making sure this is sort of covered down at the bottom. And in, in terms of how is this being done, where the process is, I'm opening up issues. I'm calling out to people on GitHub publicly. 
Um, and then when it's ready for review or discussion at, by SIG Architecture in terms of whether or not this is conformance related, um, I put it on a project board that SIG Architecture takes a look at and we discuss there. I'm just wondering why Google is driving Globant versus this group. Um, that's a really good question. I would, so no, my, no, let, let me be clear. I mean, sorry, I, I'm, I'm actually driving Globant and I'm paying them, but several folks from Google have been assisting me with that, but it is not a Google uh, task in, in, in any way. And other folks who would like to get involved in, in managing that are, are welcome to. Um, ultimately, I, I'm certainly looking to SIG architecture on feedback for where we should be prioritizing. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize that so far, the first few months have just been them getting up to speed with Go and the PR process and all the other pieces here. I also, I also want to be clear that like, I'm not, I don't want to drive all this. I just want transparency. So that way, if somebody else asks the question, which will happen, and I've already been asked uh, a number of times that the, there's a canonical location or set of locations where I can point them to. And then, you know, it's clear to everyone what's, what's yeah. going on and who's doing what. I, I also share and I apologize, desire. Aaron, for, uh, yeah, interrupting you again, but just we we are sending those updates to this email list, the Kubernetes uh, conformance workgroup email list, which is the best place to keep it. And then I'm looking forward to Aaron's discussion now on how we're going to track it more thoroughly than that. Yep, that's you put, took the words out of my mouth. Like I I don't want to be the only person running this show. My ideal scenario is that this group collectively comes to agreement on a dump truck worth of work that we can just start to turn the crank on, but we're kind of not there yet. And I've been trying to help us iterate through that. So the next area of iteration is that I noticed that Sana Boy runs conformance tests by running a Docker image that Heptio has built that uh, has a skip list inside of it such that the set of tests that Sonoboy runs is different than the set of tests we list as conformance tests inside of Kubernetes Kubernetes. I'm of the opinion that since Kubernetes, the project should be defining what the conformance tests are, that skip list should go away and those concepts should be propagated upstream. So for example, I have the skip list in the, in the meeting notes here. Like I agree that if a test has a tag of like alpha or disruptive or flaky, it should never have been tagged as conformance. And if it was, we should go back and strip it out of conformance or figure out if maybe it's not actually as flaky as we once thought, things of that nature. But ultimately my ideal scenario is that skip list goes away and conformance tests involve just focusing on tests that have the conformance tag inside of them. Yeah. I, there's no, there was no argument. And in fact, Yago and Matt Liggett were involved in the creation of those things uh, in, in the beginning. And ideally, Matt Liggett and I had both agreed that we wanted to push that container, that single artifact that everyone can use, which is the kube conformance container, into right. upstream. And that's this, that would be a canonical location that everyone could use. Uh, it just never happened. Right. So, so on, yeah. on that point specifically, I have this ideal dream world where the same image is being used to run tests for conformance and for the project CI and by end users. Practically speaking, I don't have the resources to support that within SIG testing for at least the next quarter, but that's a direction I wouldn't mind heading like in the Q4 timeframe. But in the interim, I just want to get rid of that skip list and make sure that like these are the sorts of things that should be used in the checklist of should a test be tagged conformance, yes or no. Why don't we enqueue it into the backlog? If we're doing backlog portions here and we're using the CNCF repository for it, why don't we enqueue it for the CNCF repository in the backlog? That sounds like a great idea. All right, are you taking an action item to that? Okay. Um, okay, so then my next concern is specifically one of the things in that skip list is the word kubectl. And it is not entirely, so the historical context for why kubectl is in there is because Sonoboy runs end-to-end -end tests from within the Kubernetes cluster. And for whatever reason, the kubectl tests weren't working in cluster. 
And so they just decided to skip it, right? Um, so I think that those issues have been worked through, number one. Number two, I think kubectl exercises, like the kubectl tests exercising a Kubernetes cluster are a great example of end user behavior and are very illustrative of conformance related behavior. They're already tagged as conformance. I think they should be conformance tests. Though we could go through a deeper review from subject matter experts to confirm that like nothing that isn't stable is being exercised. This, is, this falls back to architecture for this particular one uh, because they own it. The, there was a meta topic that existed originally, which is one it didn't work for all cases for other people. Um, that Matt was aware of this too as well. Uh, we, it works now because Dims and I fixed it uh, so we can enable it uh, should we want to. Uh, but there, there are macro level concerns about whether or not that behavior is aggregate level behavior versus API coverage behavior. Right. And I, don't, I don't think this group owns that space, so we can defer to architecture for that one. Yeah. Um, I have a point about that down further in terms of prioritization where I talk about like, where do we care about focusing on direct versus indirect coverage? Because I agree, kubectl probably indirectly, cover, indirectly covers a lot of functionality that we're not directly covering. Next up, uh, huge thanks to Dims. I don't think is on the call here, but he and someone else have been pushing on making sure that all of the test images involved in conformance tests support all of the architectures for which Kubernetes is built as part of the release process. And we think that that should be a mandate for a test being promoted into conformance. Um, as a result of this, I know there's a PowerPC 64 conformance uh, test being run out there now, which is great. Um, and finally, the bigger issue where I kind of want to get this group's input and shepherd discussion is like refining what the definition of conformance should be. So I have an open pull request. There are many, many dis comments and discussions there, which I haven't actually had time to fold back into the request. When I chatted personally with Tim about this, he was of the opinion that I should take all of this out to a Google Doc and we should go through one more round here which I'm happy to do. I do want to make sure that I get this group's input in consensus. But my goal is to walk away with a document that has a bullet list that is so clear and explicit that it's obvious to both people writing tests and people who are reviewing tests whether or not the test is being written in a way suitable for conformance and whether or not it's exercising a behavior suitable for conformance. To be clear here, I'm not talking about and don't care about anything related to profiles I'm focusing strictly on the corest of the barest of the core behavior that is super default. Um, so uh, the, the key thing that prompted me to start writing this doc to tighten up requirements was that years and years ago, the versioning, the version SKU requirements were maybe slightly misinterpreted to imply that a cluster that was say one nine conformant should also be passing one seven conformance tests. And that's not actually true. It turns out that client version SKU guarantees are only one version back. So in, so like the biggest change that I saw aside from refining all of the specific criteria was if you're conformant for like version 111, you only have to also be conformant for 110. You are allowed to fail V19 conformance tests. I'm curious if people within this group like interpreted it, interpreted the versioning policy that way, or if this looks, if this sounds like a change. Silence is consent. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Just curiosity, uh, well, is there an example of something that would fall into that category of not spanning two releases, but does span one release? I honestly can't think of anything. I can. Okay. okay, please. I'd love to hear it, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, so I was lurking for exactly this kind of issue. Um, right, so actually currently within Kubernetes, the only thing that multiple release of version SKU is supported for is SKU between the uh, cluster level control plane components, the API server and controller manager and scheduler, and the kubelets. So the kubelets can be 
up to two releases behind the control plane components. But we don't even support any SKU between the cluster level control plane components at all uh, officially yet, which is obviously a problem for things like HA. And uh, we don't support downgrades officially, which is a problem for lots of other reasons. Uh, and Cube Control only supports one release forward and backward uh, of SKU. So uh, 1.8 Cube Control will work with 1.9, and a 1.10 Cube Control should work with 1.9 uh, control plane, um, which is al also different than the Cubelet uh, control plane SKU. 1.10 Cubelets are not supported on a 1.9 control plane. Uh, so obviously that's not ideal. There's been ongoing work for literally years to try to improve uh, various aspects of that, but it is where we are. So, so Brian, can you elaborate a little? Because I, I understand conceptually what you said there, um, but what I'm trying to understand is aside from uh, removal of a feature, in other words, it's been deprecated, do you actually have examples in mind where the functionality changed across two releases, but it didn't change across one release? Because I'm trying to wrap my head around how that could possibly happen. Yes, I and mean, there have been a, a number of cases. So the API machinery has been uh, evolving heavily over the past few years. Entirely new things were added, like um, our uh, current API discovery mechanism. And uh, the Swagger 1.2 was also exported, which is different from our, our sort of custom API discovery mechanism. But the, for we effectively used the Swagger just for schema discovery and not for endpoint discovery for various reasons. Uh, that was added for Cube Control validation. And then it was evolved over time to uh, Swagger 2 or what became Open API. Um, so there were a bunch of dances that needed to be performed to transition various details. There are also a lot of bugs in the schema information and things like that that had to be fixed. So kludges had to be put in and then were later removed. Uh, so there was a bunch of complexity around that as well as changes in uh, garbage collection and reaping uh, and all sorts of things. Cube Control had a lot of logic in it. It was basically a fat client. And these things were not officially in the API, really. They were just in Cube Control. And um, it was sort of, we didn't have the mechanisms in place for Cube Control to actually really reason about what version of the control plane it was talking to. The, like, there were all kinds of issues. So basically, it was just through testing that we ensured compatibility and, practically speaking, there was only one release of compatibility. There are, there are still, there's still very complex functionality that's in Cube Control. Cube Control Apply is probably the, the most, the biggest and most complex. Um, that basically doesn't behave properly if the fields don't exactly match between the versions. Uh, the behavior is very surprising. We're moving on, we're working on moving that into the API server itself to address that and other problems. Um, but it's still going to be several releases before that transition is completely done. So yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very complex, uh, very complex set of surface area. There have been other issues that were unintentional in the tests, like tests that depended on event content, which wasn't actually supposed to be guaranteed at stable as part of the API service and things like that. But I consider those things as just bugs. Yeah, Aaron. Right. So like, this is, this is the level of detail I need to avoid if I'm going to get through the rest of our stuff. So I did want to make sure we entertained the question. The, the actionable question I have for the group is where would you prefer we iterate on this definition, Google Doc or PR? Google Doc with a timeout and then PR is the typical modus operandi for stuff like this. That's so applies to such a large audience. Okay. Um, I will get to that sometime in the next three days. <laughs> um, if Tim, since you had expressed an interest in being actively involved, if you want to kick it off, that's 
fine by me, but um, like I, it is important to me. I opened it up a while ago and then I haven't gotten back to it because I've been behind on other things, but I will start it up and iterate us on that discussion soon. Yeah, cool. Action item is great. Uh, um, yeah, all right, moving on. So let's talk about refining the definition of what improved coverage means substantively. Ultimately, I think what this group is after is to improve feature or behavior coverage, and there's no way we can have an exact measurement for this. Uh, I think a lot of the features or behaviors may ultimately be um, defined in such a way that even like very specific code coverage may not catch end-to-end um, -end behaviors or real-world effects of things. But I do think that proxies are useful for us to, if nothing else, track progress and possibly inform discussions, but we will ultimately require human subject matter experts um, to really chew through this. Um, I also don't think that there was ever really agreed upon definition of done from this group that we're going to reach 100% X or 100% you know, API coverage, for example. I think the, the goal was just improve coverage. And I also feel like there's been this perception that great, we have conformance tests, but they don't really cover anything. And I'm curious what or how people are coming to that determination when they make that statement. So I'm trying to get us to, to measuring our expectations starting with less granular measurements and moving us to more detailed or more granular measurements over time. So things this group have talked about in the past were like client-side API coverage information. Uh, this is Umichi's tool, which currently lives in test infra experiment coverage. Um, there's server-side API coverage, which uh, Hippie Hacker has done with API Snoop. The version of that that I most prefer at the moment is the audit log review thing, which you all recognize as that wonderful sunburst graph that breaks down API coverage by API group, um, by the endpoint, and by the verb that we're hitting that endpoint with. The problem with this approach is that it relies on audit logs and the default audit policy filters out a lot of high volume and high traffic events. So it looks like we're not actually covering a bunch of APIs. The current modification of PR that's in flight for dynamic uh, configuration of audit logs would enable this behavior. And right. Well, so I, we also have the opposite problem, right? Of things appearing to be covered that aren't really covered. Like every controller is going to pull the for resources that it cares about, even if those resources don't exist. Right. So and um, system okay. resources, I wouldn't consider to be the same as coverage as user resources either. Right. So that's why um, I linked that there is a cap for dynamic audit configuration, but I don't expect that to land fully within this release. Um, Most uh, of it is landing in okay. one twelve. Most of it. Okay. Very excited. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks to Hippie Hackers prompting and help and uh, uh, Catherine Berry from Google who has joined us recently, um, we're working on looking at API coverage from audit logs with the user agent included. So there was um, initially some work done to try and correlate like what test causes what API endpoints to be exercised by doing this manual process of like running the test client side, then SSHing over and like running that stuff over here. And like it worked, but it's kind of uh, hacky. So what we're doing instead now is the user agent gets logged as part of audit logs and then um, the E2E client will set the user agent to the name of the test that is running things. So this way we can filter specifically down to like which test is running which API endpoints. Um, even without that today, uh, Catherine put together a pull request into API Snoop for a version of coverage called E2E coverage view, which allows us to filter API coverage by user agent. So we can exclude all of the API coverage that happens from things like controller managers sweeping through or scheduler trying to pull every single node in pod, right? Um, if we have time, I'd love for us to show demos on those, but in the interest of moving quickly, I hope you don't mind if I just kind of move forward. Um, the next thing that uh, Catherine has been working on is what do we do when API coverage isn't enough? 
Um, at some point, you know, we could like cover all the APIs with stupid CRUD tests, but we're clearly not going to be exercising all the behavior. So generally in the world of unit tests, what you do for this is you look at line by line coverage. Uh, yes, that, that is a 12 blinking clock. Thank you. It, it, you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, so in the world of unit tests, you look to line coverage for this sort of thing. Um, so we're trying to run every Kubernetes process as a unit test and get line coverage from the Kubernetes system itself. Catherine has a design proposal out there that we are running through the community. We'd also appreciate input from this group. Um, I think especially because at the moment we're really interested in trying to make sure that we, we gather the data, um, how we ensure that the data is presented in a usable manner could probably use some input from folks here. Um, but the idea is to do things like, you know, collect coverage from every node in the cluster and then merge that coverage information together. So even if tests end up exercising different kubelets, we get the union of what code was actually covered. Um, this is the sort of thing we can probably take to a discussion with subject matter experts to verify whether or not we've hit all of the appropriate corner cases for behavior. So with that, um, let's talk about how we can use this information to help us improve coverage and how we can prioritize where we should be improving coverage. And I think this kind of ties into an action item that, that Hippie had. Um, if we look purely at API coverage and we try to go after the biggest, least covered area, I think that's the wrong approach because it could result in us going after high visibility but low value targets. I think that higher value targets of coverage are areas where functionality can be implemented by plugins or substitutes. So I'm thinking of things like CRI, CNI, and CSI. And my goal is not to certify those implementations, right? Like I think there should be a CSI suite, a CRI suite, a CNI suite to make sure that like a plugin is a, a CNI plugin. As you best are as covering the direct area that William defined as profiles. Um, uh, well, no. but what I'm what I'm trying to cover is, given those plugins, does a Kubernetes cluster still satisfy the core behaviors that we expect of a Kubernetes cluster? Right. And so, so, so I just want to comment on this. So, this has basically been my direction since the start of the conformance effort. Since the purpose of conformance is testing compatibility, we need to focus on the areas where compatibility is at risk. Compatibility is at risk in areas where there are mul multiple implementations, right? So that's things that are explicitly pl pluggable, like CRI, and it's things that people swap out, like the scheduler or kubelet or um, ingress controllers or whatever. So starting with, you know, Aaron mentioned the node conformance earlier. Uh, pod, the pod surface area is the number one most used API in Kubernetes. It also happens to be highly pluggable. Um, so I think that more than justifies the focus on pod related functionality first. Sure, I agree to that. That, okay. that makes a ton of sense. I think the framing of the conversation piece is inverted, uh, but yes, I agree. Yeah, that's like the pod is, like the fundamental thing that makes the rest of Kubernetes work. So if we can't guarantee that a pod works the way it's supposed to, we can't guarantee the rest of the stuff. So yeah, just, they're, 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 they're just for clarity though too, there is behavior that is incongruent and inconsistent across mm -hmm. different like CNI providers, for example, network policy is wildly different. Uh, so you, um, we, there we as to, there's aspects that we need to be careful of there. Yes, we need to identify distinguished portable and non-portable behaviors that are expected. Um, this has come up in a variety of different contexts since you mentioned profiles. Uh, Windows, for example, there are a number of Linuxisms, sadly. Uh, even things that are specific to specific Linux distributions, uh, like SE Linux versus AppArmor, that are in the API. We're going to have to annotate those ideally in the API so that we exclude them. You know, when we have profiles, we may want to include them in profiles, but right now uh, we don't have that. So we would just exclude those things. There are things that are going to be fairly subtle that should be consistent. Uh, networking in particular is one of those, like testing that pod networking actually works. You have addresses, IP addresses for pods that are routable to each other on different nodes. 
is something that I don't believe we test. And I don't know that that will be covered explicitly by line coverage or API coverage or anything like that, but we will need to make sure that that gets tested. Brian, I, I'm certainly supportive of focusing on tests that matter as opposed to just a percentage number. Um, I do seem to remember back in December uh, at the live meeting in Austin, you had mentioned an effort, I think that was being looked at inside Google that would provide more of a base level coverage of just the um, just the kind of existence of the API and maybe whether they um, followed the rest verbs. Uh, yeah, Am I remembering correctly and did that effort go anywhere? Um, I basically told people to stop working on it because the stuff they were doing was not going to be useful. It was like exercising a sm very small uh, amount of the API server as to what they were doing. So we have multiple efforts underway focusing on getting things that are currently in node conformance into the actual conformance suite so that we get more co pod coverage is sort of one, uh, not entirely low hanging fruit, but uh, not so, uh, doesn't require rocket science either. Um, existing E2E tests and other areas of commonly uh, used stable portable features, uh, we're trying to get into the conformance suite. So those things are hopefully are usefully increasing the coverage. Um, but I think just hitting every API endpoint has effectively no value. So I hand, hand up. Um, if you assume that the Kubernetes code base itself doesn't change based upon each provider, which I think is for the most part probably true, then I definitely agree with everything Brian was saying there. It's all uh, the flow points. That's so not. That, that's not actually true. Well, I. I <laughs> but but you, but your assertion there about the the biggest concern are the the plug points, CRI, CNI, that kind of stuff. I, I think in general that's probably accurate. And uh, my question was actually more of a tangential one to that, which is. If someone's then going to claim conformance to our test suite, um, do they have to say which plugins they're using, or is, are we just comfortable saying, "Gentlemen's agreements, you're not going to swap at your CNI implementation as right after you run the conformance test." There's a well, part in the way. There's a part in the conformance process that clearly defines how to make the experiment reproducible to other consumers. That is part of the CNCF effort. So they need to specify versions as well as uh, you know other details of how they created X, which will have the. Yeah. Okay, that helps. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are and, configuration and have things like a, along those lines also. And we also okay. have a process of like if, if if people can't reproduce the results, there is like a a reporting process for that as well. So there's, okay, there's cool. definitely a strong incentive to make sure things are reproducible. Okay. But Brian, can I just, and we can do this in our next meeting or by email, but just one more minute on the um, very shallow broad coverage, which is we did have a case where a major provider of Kubernetes, um, their hosted implementation was not compliant because they had turned off a couple API features um, that they didn't think were necessary. And thankfully those were caught by the original 1.7 conformance suite and they decided to turn those back on so that they could be conformant. So I, I, I do just want to ask here, because it, it does seem something like that's something particularly um, hippie hacker might be able to do, because it's kind of the inverse of the API snoop of um, instead of capturing which call is being made, that we could potentially just go through the open API swagger definition and just um, blindly call every single thing. But if but you then, blindly call every single thing, there, view is, there are many APIs in that that are not part of the conformance suite for a good reason. And okay, that, and, and there's the not information a clear... about which ones those are are not in the yeah. API discovery information. Like, I personally um, would have no it's... objections if anybody from this group wanted to volunteer people to go work on writing tests to cover all of the stable APIs. Great, go for so, it. So there's a meta topic here that I think is worth discussing, which is the first thing I brought up. Right. <laughs> we, would we would like a backlog. We would like folks to groom it. And we would like to have people who are executing against it, you know, give feedback at a regular interval. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, so I, somewhere, I, yeah, somewhere I have a doc with high level guidance on areas I think deserve prioritization. Those need to get translated into actually lower level details about what 
functionality actually needs to get tested and that can populate the backlog. But I am not gonna waste my time reviewing things that I believe have low or no value. This, I mean, okay, thanks. I think this is us kind of at least hashing out that initial priority of, as we look to populate the backlog, do we collectively agree that focusing on the pod as the fundamental abstraction of Kubernetes above all else is the most important thing? Okay. Yes. I would just say when, next time you try to phrase that in an argument, invert the statement. <laughs> okay. Perhaps I should have started that and then explained why. But because like, I don't care about all those pluggable things. I want to make sure that regardless of what those are, that the pod still works the way the pod ought to work. And that's, I believe, where we feel like we're not covering pods very well. Um, okay, so now, and again, this is, the, this is definitely trying to tie back to Tim's, like how do we collectively get involved? How have I been doing this right now? Um, so, you know, that, that conformance doc, um, tries to lay out both what are the criteria for a test to be promoted to conformance as well as the process to uh, promote a test to conformance. That process basically is write the test, prove that the test works, and then we'll talk about promoting it into conformance. Um, I have made sure that all work related to this is labeled with a GitHub label called area slash conformance. I thus far have been driving those tests forward to LGTM either myself or with subject matter experts. I then put them on a conformance test review board that lives in the architecture tracking repo of Kubernetes SIGs. If you don't care to remember all that, it's linked in the doc here. And then I show up to SIG architecture to badger Brian and everybody there about like, what is it gonna take to get these things approved for conformance? Because usually right now we're at the state where we're still trying to iterate on really fine grained details of what conformance means, like what ways of testing functionality are acceptable, what functionality is acceptable. Um, and so like right now, I know Tim saying like, we've unleashed all these people to be clear, it is me shepherding and like two contractors. So we don't have like a whole herd of people who are bum rushing the project. I'd love for that to happen. In order for that to happen, I need a dump truck of test cases. And I don't have that right now. I think like the ideal scenario, the current scenario is like, we're just kind of doing this back and forth, suggesting test cases from subject matter experts. And then we have um, Brian Grant and Clayton Coleman as kind of the SIG architecture bottleneck to, to figure out if that makes sense. I wanna help us like grow this understanding to larger pools of people to get to that dump truck of test cases. And this is 100% where I could use this group's help. Yeah, and it, effectively we could uh, rope in more of the API approvers and even some people beyond that. I think we need shadow reviewers so they can people can start to understand the types of issues we have concern about. And we can make sure that those things get documented. Like some things are documented, but they're like in the API convention document about this is not guaranteed to be a stable part of the API and things like that. Um, so we need to collate a list or a list of pointers or something of those issues as we surface them. Like there are questions about, yes, this is a pod feature, but it's not guaranteed to be portable or in the past it hasn't been stable or it's not part of CRI yet. Uh, like they're all a host of details that, uh, that one could get into. Uh, when reviewing these things. We just don't have enough of them under our belt to have a comprehensive list of criteria. I mean, to be clear, a lot of what's been happening right now is I've been kind of correcting and refining the definition of conformance. We really haven't been going out there and writing brand new cases to cover new things. It's more been a process of identifying which test cases already exist, which look like they could be promoted to conformance, or which test cases were called conformance but weren't actually being run. But at some point, I'm going to run out of those two things, and it's going to come time to like write some new tests. Yeah, and along those lines, for people that, who didn't hear the discussion uh, that we had in SIG Architecture and maybe elsewhere about it, at some point, uh, there's going to need to be some engineering efforts around building 
new test frameworks that will en enable us to run tests in multiple modes, right? There are a lot of advantages to writing smaller scope tests, unit tests and integration tests that can be run outside of the end to end test framework that we have. They're faster, they're more efficient, they're more stable, they're more debuggable and so on, right? Like all the reasons why unit tests are good. But so if we had 100% coverage in unit tests, we could still have 0% coverage in the conformance tests because they weren't running an E2E. So we are going to need frameworks that can actually abstract that away and run the tests in multiple modes. You can directly invoke the functionality in the unit test and you can invoke it through an off the shelf cluster in the end to end tests and still test correct behavior. So that's more of a rocket sciencey thing. I don't think it's something that contractors can necessarily do, um, but somebody is gonna have to work on that and we'll probably need more than one such thing. Uh, so Ben, the elder, has been taking a stab at it a little bit in test infra, um, but that's very early stage still with the Kubernetes and Docker experts. Uh, but that doesn't co cover multi-node or any of the advanced scenarios yet, but can at least provide a baseline for some set of conformance tests we are hoping, uh, but then that's still a work in progress and there are PRs in test infra. Well, the Docker and Docker thing, if that's what you're re referring to, I don't really consider it to be a unit test. Maybe it could be considered an integration test. I mean, obviously it wouldn't actually require a cloud provider or actual multiple nodes. So that's a useful thing for just exercising uh, the components themselves, although not in a real world scenario. I'd say that's like a whole nother category of test. We'd need to be able to run that right. in both the Docker and Docker mode and on real clusters. They're typically partial integration tests of some kind because they require other information in order for you to work on it. But that's 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 splitting hairs at this point. Yeah, that like I view all of that discussion as relative to improving the testing hygiene of the Kubernetes project as a whole. Ultimately, conformance tests still have to be run as black box tests that simulate real world scenarios as end to end tests. So. Tim, since I've been trying to tie back to your point, like how do you think this group can help me accomplish the goals I just laid out above? I think we need to start with a backlog and, and have someone run through prioritization that can say like do AB first and A, B. So because right so, now I have zero visibility as I mentioned before. Like what's the level of granularity we should be doing for say, okay, we've all agreed the pod is the fundamental abstraction. How do we break that up into appropriate units of work? Because like one Uber issue, say cover pods, that, that won't work, right? Just like the way we do everything else in Kubernetes, we, we have a large breakdown ticket, which kind of enumerates the state space of the things that need to be done. And then we have a bunch of PRs of whatever that is. Uh oh, did my internet break? Can folks hear me? I got you. You were a little laggy. Okay. I didn't hear most of it. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was so, me or him. Uh, no, umbrella, uh, an umbrella issue, and then basically enumerate the state space in that umbrella issue and link back to that umbrella issue. Yeah, over time. Yeah. That's the way we've done it since Epoch. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be that hard just to look through all the fields in pod and group them in some rational way, like liveness probes, exec-based, HTTP-based, whatever, readiness probes, same thing. Um, and just go through and figure out which things we have coverage for, which shouldn't be too hard because there aren't that many. Um, and then think about other cases which aren't just reflected by what's in spec, like you know, interpod networking and things like that. And crowdsource that amongst some domain experts. Uh, and that should be a, a reasonably complete list, certainly vastly better than what we have now. Like some, somewhere, do, for some other reason, I had a list of some things like, can two containers share, actually share uh, a config map? Or can, you know, if one container writes uh, empty dir, can the other one see that? Things like that. Um, so just in case I haven't said it enough, like I really don't want 
Google to be the owner of this. I think this group is the owner of this. And if you want to help out, I more than encourage it. I would greatly welcome it. Um, I, I think that uh, I apologize that I didn't really get a chance to demo it today since we're kind of at time, but uh, Hippie and uh, Catherine both put in a lot of great work to show some of the things that I linked. If you want to take a look at them after the fact, it's great. And I'll make sure we have lots of pretty shiny data and graphs to show next time. So please, please I'll just reach mention out. that um, I had moved this back to a monthly meeting because they'd been a little quieter. If we're having a real active period right now, I'm happy to move it back to twice a month. But uh, why don't we go monthly for another month or two and see if we keep running out of time like this. Um, and I, I do want to remind folks that the mailing list is there and uh, all of us are on it. So please feel free to engage there. So I just want to let people know that in terms of my SIG architecture related work, I am prioritizing conformance test reviews over reviews of API changes. That is tests of existing functionality or I am prioritizing ahead of people helping people add new functionality to Kubernetes. Great. Okay. Okay, see everyone in a month and uh, on the mailing list.